Check out these moments from the prison confessions of Gypsy Rose Blanchard. Rod and I met in high school. We became best of friends. He was nice, outgoing, funny character. Rod was 17 years old when he met Dee Dee. And I'll never forget when he came up to me and he's like, oh, I met this girl, you gotta meet her. So he introduced me. She was real sweet, real nice. And I clearly could see that she was in love with Rod. In fact, Rod's mom worked at the library and she was checking in the books and came across a book on how to get pregnant. And when she went to stamp it in, Dee Dee's name was, was there. And next thing you know, Dee Dee's pregnant. Nine months later, Gypsy Rose Blanchard came into the world. What we notice with mothers with Munchausen by proxy, and I say mothers because 95% are, is that they'll bring the child to the doctor, they'll say something's terribly wrong, you've got to figure out what it is, and the doctor does a bunch of tests and then says, we can't find anything wrong. Instead of being like a normal parent, oh, phew, I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you for reassuring me. These mothers will be upset. What do you mean nothing's wrong? Oh no, you've got to keep working and they will find expert after expert for second opinion and fifth opinion. These people are not insane. They are exceedingly calculated. They plan, they hide the behavior, they go to great lengths to maintain that they're right. I remember there was a medication that I was allergic to and my mother would give me too much of that medication and then take pictures, show them to the doctor and say, this is when she ate sugar. So I was having a legitimate reaction, but it was not to what she was saying it was. I didn't think I was allergic to sugar. I would have a candy bar here and there, and I would have no reaction to it. But at the time, I really didn't understand what was going on. When perpetrators of Munchausen syndrome by proxy finally get the diagnosis they've been searching for, they almost have Ah, uh, ah, uh, well, and you can almost see the gratification. At that age, I really didn't understand why my mother was moving us from place to place to place, or why at certain times we didn't have a place to live. But it, it really kind of showed me that all I really had in my life was my mother. Since my incarceration, I am finally free to build relationships and friendships. The best memory that I have in my entire life is the day that I got to prison and I got to go out to the picnic tables. And I'm like, I'm free. I'm free to have friends. I'm free to do what I want. I might be in a controlled environment, but this is nice. You're making me cry. <laughs> it's the truth. It's such a good memory. <laughs> yeah. When Gypsy was around eight, Didier called one day and said she was diagnosed with leukemia. Like, this poor girl, she has all of these illnesses and then has this. Honestly, I really didn't know what cancer was, but I was going through so many medications and surgeries that I didn't question it. Most of the family felt that it was not real. You know, it's kind of like the wheelchair. But then Dee Dee was shaving Gypsy's head and seeing that the medicine is making her hair fall out. So you really didn't know what was going on. Of course, it was 
years before we found out that, you know, she didn't have leukemia. That wasn't true. That all of it is a lie. Munchausen by proxy perpetrators go to the ends of the earth to maintain the charade of having a sick child. Feeding too. <gasps> wow. After looking at the medical records, apparently Dee Dee had suggested to different doctors that Gypsy was not getting enough calories to allow her to gain weight, meaning by, by mouth, which is just wild because all of that was a lie. The, the documents that we saw at Gypsy said that you have a fear of eating. That's ridiculous. <laughs> is that something like my mom said? Yes. Wow, no, I never had a fear of eating. Regardless of what Dee Dee said, it's a doctor's job to figure out what's real and what's not. And that was not done for Gypsy. Unfortunately, the decision was made to have a surgical procedure to put a hole into her skin, down to her stomach, in order to feed. My mom used to try to make things that was being done to me fun. And so, like, the feeding tube's name was Mickey Butts. And so she came up with a song. It went like this. Mickey Button. We find feeding tubes such a common aspect of Munchausen syndrome by proxy because a feeding tube gives a parent almost unlimited control to poison and medicate, starve, and feed their kid. After the doctor placed the feeding tube in my stomach, I spent six months straight inpatient in Children's Hospital in New Orleans. But it wasn't too scary because um, there was another little girl that was inpatient, and she had a feeding tube. And so um, seeing that she had one, it she had had uh, a feeding tube installed, so you know she couldn't have any f physical hard foods, and so they need to clean out some of that stuff from time to time. The feeding tube was painful, um, especially when it needed to be changed because stomach acid erodes the internal hardware of it. And so every six months, it has to be replaced. And when it has to be replaced, the child or person is not put under any kind of general anesthesia. Um, they just deflate the balloon that's inside the stomach that keeps the feeding to their place. And then they just flip it out. Um, but it expands the incision that it, it gets placed in. And so it, that part is particularly painful. It made me stream a couple times. I always would tell her, I'm so proud of you, you know, for being so strong and, and being in such good spirits. Um, she never sounded depressed or, or sad. I think I had the feeding tube placed in when I was about eight years old and had that feeding tube changed every six months until I was 24. So you had to get that changed twice a year for 15 years? For 15 years. I don't believe that there is a single rational human being on the planet that would not agree that what Dee Dee did to Gypsy was one of the most egregious um, forms of parental abuse you can imagine. It just breaks my heart so much to think how much I trusted her. And it makes me angry how she can look at this child and then do what she did. Now looking back on it, living with my mother, the web of lies just ran so deep. I think that she just spun it so big that she was enveloped within it and couldn't escape. 
after I went to prison, after the murder, everything came out about everything that my mother was selling me. A lot of this information had came to me by either Mike, my attorney, or Christy, my stepmom. And then it got back to me. Mike had told me about what my mother was telling people about my father or about our family, our relatives. It was a lot to absorb. My two attorneys are telling me that my mother has something called Munchausen by proxy, and she was using me for money and abusing me medically. And then to tell me all of the lies and manipulation on top of it. So I felt, did I ever know her at all? My own mother? Did I ever know this woman at all? We landed on the rooftop of St. John's Hospital. And I just remember thinking, okay, we're at a hospital. This is normal. <laughs> you know this? Both of them exuded just wild enthusiasm and gratefulness. Gypsy's demeanor didn't strike me as potentially unusual simply because I knew ahead of time that she had what was described as a developmental delay. I'm used to seeing parents being really resilient. Dee Dee was no different. The interactions between Dee Dee and Gypsy were one that were not atypical of uh, a mother and a child with developmental delay and a lot of medical problems. It was one of fun interaction. Physically, there was some hugging and hand holding and those type of things, nothing unusual. Before the appointment, she's like, now whenever it comes to the reflex test, make sure you keep your legs super still. And she would put her arm around me and hug my shoulder, or she would squeeze my hand that was the signal to shut up. The way that Gypsy acted, wearing princess dresses, the way she talked, the things that she referenced that she liked to do, were like a kindergartner. When my mother and I moved to Missouri, I would have been 14 years old, and she was telling me that I was 12 years old. Dee Dee was pretty clear that Gypsy had a history of cancer, asthma, some sort of muscular disorder. My mother would often tell other people and tell me that I would only have a life expectancy of seven, and then it was 15, um, and then it was 20. I think to some degree, I knew it was a facade. However, I didn't know the malicious intent behind the facade. Dee Dee didn't have the medical records. She said they're gone because it was chaos down in New Orleans right after Katrina. So Dee Dee became the sole place for information. Probably the biggest concern I had was just this history of cancer. Dee Dee could not give either the diagnosis nor really the length of treatment that she had been on. That was unusual. And to me, that was a red flag. So the question is, at what point do you trust the parent to be accurate with the information? Can I trust what Dee Dee's telling me? My understanding that your client is going to plead guilty to the class A felony of murder in the second degree and with a plea agreement that she's to be sentenced uh, to 10 years in the Missouri Department of Corrections. Today, we uh, entered a plea in Ms. Blanchard's case. In July of 2016, Gypsy pled guilty to second degree murder. Be the judgment and sentence of the court that you be sentenced to 10 years in the Missouri Department of Corrections. Probation will be denied. In Gypsy's case, she was given a 10 year sentence, which requires her to serve at least eight and a half years before she's eligible for parole. The parole board in Gypsy's case will also be wanting to hear from Gypsy herself, from any family members.
My family in general, there's a lot of guilt on both sides. There's still certain people that are just so overwhelmed with emotion that they really just don't know what to say to me at this point. I think I first started to learn that drugs were available in prison when I started seeing other women get high. I tried Suboxone and it gave me the same high as taking pain pills. And instantly I was brought back to the addiction that I had to pain pills back when I was living with my mother. And then one day, one of the women that I owed $50 to for a bunch of pills, she was pressuring me to get paid. And so I called Christy and I told her that I accidentally broke this girl's CD player and if she could please spend $50. We're the type of people if you're borrowing something from somebody and it breaks, you gotta pay for it. I said, okay. I said, I'll send it. It had been eating at me for years that I lied to Christy. I hated myself and I hated what I became. So I decided to tell Christy. When Gypsy told me, I was upset, but she told me the truth. And that's, to me, at the end of the day, that's what mattered. I was really happy that I can tell Christy anything. And I'm clean, I'm sober, and I'm not that person anymore. Nobody knows that I even had a addiction before prison, let alone in prison. Hopefully, she stays on this straight and narrow. And as far as Gypsy learning the lies and manipulations from her mom, I've noticed that she's learning to not repeat that pattern. We were bonded by this lie together. Like, we couldn't escape each other. I got mixed up with the wrong crowd. And this particular crowd was into some bad things. Yeah. And they had influenced me to get into some bad things. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. she just told me she forgave me. And I think that's really when I started to realize the love of a parent. We all make mistakes. You have to trust your parents that you can tell them anything and know that, you know, they love you unconditionally and it's okay. Yeah, you've grown so much. That's. It's glad that you, you can realize that too, you know. She didn't tell me what it was, but I love talking to her on the phone, and I think that's what we need. We still have a long way to, you know. Um, we, we just need to spend some time together. OK, love you, baby. Talk to you later. Love you. Bye -bye. Thanks for calling. Bye. I wasn't having in-person visits with my father. We would still occasionally talk on the phone, but my mother was right beside me, telling me exactly what to tell him. When I talked to her, she would say, I'm a little tired or something, but she just seemed like a normal kid, apart from having to be helped in and out of the wheelchair. Uh, she seemed like a trooper. She was happy. She never complained about any of it. Not seeing my father for six years didn't have hardly any effect on me or my emotional state because I wasn't allowed to have a relationship with my father. My mother used to talk about my father in such negative light, so it wasn't like I missed him in any way because my mother had manipulated me to think that he didn't love me or want to be a part of my life.